Okay, um, we finished the last video and I was talking about central nervous system depressants and it got kind of long, so I cut it and I want to just do a quick little clip on um, a little bit more on depression, um, things that factor in in terms of the degree of depression we see with these agents, and then I want to just briefly discuss the anesthetics. So really when it remember what we talked about in the previous video was that all of the CNS depressants the ones we focused on were barbiturates and benzodiazepines but we could use alcohol as well all of them have the potential to produce quite a good degree of depression it all just depends on the dose so dose is one of the major factors that is going to um, depend on how much depression we actually see the larger the dose of course the the, uh, the greater the degree of depression another factor that's important is how often you are um, administering the medication um, if you recall from the very beginning of our course we talked a little bit about dosing on the half-life and dosing strategies in general and the goal of dosing on the half-life is to ultimately, after a series of subsequent um, doses, reach what we call a steady state, which is what we're most likely trying to achieve in the when we use these drugs. Um, we're trying to maintain some some level of depression in many cases over quite a long period of time. So one of the ways that we can increase or decrease, see an increase or decrease in the de degree of depression is how often we're administering these drugs. Um, so frequency is another factor. And then the third factor is how you're going to give it. <clears throat> the fastest way to get the drug in and to produce the greatest degree of depression is going to be an IV administration. Oral is going to take longer for the drug to become effective, and then um, it's also in some cases going to uh, take longer for the drug to be eliminated. So the time of onset is really what it's all about when we look at the route of administration. So let me show you a little picture here. Um, you can see on the right are degrees of depression, sedation, hypnosis, and topping off here at general anesthesia. Um, 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 levels of the drug in the brain plotted against the time. So first we have our first um, little chart here, or the first line here, which would be, um, if we were sitting together live, I would ask you what kind of administration does that look like? And hopefully you're saying it looks like oral administration, and that's exactly right. When we administer a drug orally, you'll see it takes some time for it to start to climb until we actually, in this case, reach sedation, which looks like that's probably the um, objective. This would be a larger dose, same route of administration, right? So the difference between the red line and the green line is actually the dose, how much of it you actually gave. Here's another line that's going to be a different administration. What do we think it is here? Hopefully you're thinking, oh, it looks like IV, and that would be right. IV administration starts off high, you're putting it right in the blood, so the blood concentration immediately is gonna be high and then it will slowly go down. Um, and you can see actually the duration of action from time of administration to elimination and where it really sort of gets it starts to kind of it comes in quickly and then gets it gets eliminated quite quickly as well more quickly even so than either of the oral doses and then the other thing so we looked at dose we looked at two different routes of administration and the final thing i want to show you here would be frequency of the dose and that's where you start to see the the levels of the drug concentration in the blood kind of waffling back and forth that would be a frequency of administration so if we keep administering the drug and that kind of makes sense right you just keep giving it orally in this case you're going to ultimately see them reach anesthesia but it takes a while right as opposed to right if we're looking here and we're looking here we would, if we wanted to put somebody under quickly, which is where we're going next, we'd want to use this, giving them a whole bunch of drug very frequently. It, it, yeah, you ultimately get there, but not in a way that's actually reasonable. Okay, so our three factors it, that um, play a role in degree of depression, again, are dose, 
frequency of administration and route of administration. All right, so I wanna just round this off by a quick discussion on general anesthetics. Remember, the state of general anesthesia it implies a loss of consciousness. So this is the absence of perception of all sensations, one of which is pain. So when we think of an general anesthetics for pain, the reason why they don't perceive pain is because they're not conscious. It's not because the drug itself is an analgesic agent. So the depth of an anesthesia is going to be achieved by more than one drug. There's not one drug that's going to meet all of our goals for general anesthesia. We have to give a combination. In most cases, again, the um, general anesthetics are going to be administered via the, either the inhalation route or most commonly the intravenous route, depending on the circumstance. Like, for example, like in the dental office, inhalation anesthetics are used quite frequently, but in surgical situations, an IV is more likely going to be the um, route, preferred route. All right, so here's our three goals of general anesthesia. One is analgesia, which is a decrease in the perception, decrease in the perception of pain. And the drugs that are used for that are going to be our painkillers. Um, what we're going to see most oftentimes used in this context are the narcotics. Ketamine is kind of a very interesting drug. It is a classified as an analgesic agent, but mostly because it causes sort of what we refer to as a disassociative state. Ketamine is a, um, a drug very similar to PCP, and it's a strange drug, and it um, basically causes people to be like, disassociated from themselves, if you will. So they're not really conscious, but they're not unconscious completely either. But they're definitely not processing. So I always say like it looks as if the lights are on, but nobody's home, right? They're, they're not responsive, but they're also not totally laid out. So that, that would, in that disassociative state, they're not going to be able to perceive pain. And so ketamine is used in that kind of a scenario. Ketamine, um, isn't used that frequently because it causes some pretty strange side effects. Um, but when some, when you have to do something quickly, like for example, you'll see ketamine used in burn units with some degree of frequency if they're changing dressings, which can be quite painful, um, but can be pretty fast. Um, and also sometimes they'll use ketamine when they're doing things with kids. But ketamine causes sometimes like hallucinations and really bad dreams in some cases. So. Um, that's one of the side effects of ketamine, but it's an analgesic agent. Um, so one goal of, anal of general anesthesia is analgesia. The, the next is loss of consciousness, and that's going to usually be um, achieved by administering gaseous uh, anesthetics or depressants. Um, nitrous oxide is one example of that. Uh, and then the third goal is muscle relaxation, right? You don't want to moving around if you're trying to do some sort of surgical procedure, or remove something or change a dressing or whatnot. So those are our three goals of general anesthesia. And as, again, I said on the previous slide that m most oftentimes the routes of administration for these agents, because they have to be effective pretty quickly and their, their um, blood levels have to be controlled pretty tightly, are going to be inhalation or intravenous administration. And again, not any one drug can accomplish all of those goals. So um, just really quickly on the inhalation anesthetics, I gave you some examples of them up there. There's tons, you're not responsible for knowing them. Um, but they are, so this is inhalation. They work really fast, so it's hard to see somebody move through all of the stages of anal anal anesthesia, which I'm gonna show you in a, in a slide or two. Um, but they do cause a loss of consciousness and an amnesia. You can see the toxic effects. They're going to depress respiration, their central nervous system depressants, right? So lower BP, in, um, decrease heart rate, potentially cause um, arrhythmias, and also, also with the inhalation anesthetics, depending on which ones you use, sometimes they'll cause post-operative nausea and vom vomiting. One of the things we worry about is malignant hyperthermia, which is a, an, an inability to keep the body temperature down. And that's part of the depression that we see with these agents. You can see nitric oxide is a little bit different than the others, kind of a different animal. It's used as an adjunct. It's not potent enough to induce full anesthesia on its own. But when you use it with others, you, you're not as worried about respiratory depression and some of the blood pressure issues. 
So again, it's kind of a tricky business, general anesthesia, right? They, we want to, we want the person to be out, but we don't want them to to that we don't want their circulatory system to collapse. And so, there's that's sort of a, a a tightly titrated issue with lots of different medications. Um, here's some examples of <clears throat> I'm just giving you two of the IV anesthetics. I talked about ketamine a minute ago, but we'll talk about it again. On the left, you see thiopental, which is a barbiturate. Barbiturates are used in as general anesthetics, as are benzodiazepines. Um, you can see, in, and a thiopental would be given intravenously, so they're going to work very quickly. Loss of consciousness comes on almost immediately, within just a few seconds. Um, same with ketamine. Ketamine is going to work really quickly. Usually the onset of these are like 15 seconds or so. Um, and then they tend to be eliminated quite quickly as well. Um, uh, same kind of side effects as we just mentioned, um, but we don't seem to see as much arrhythmia with thiopental. But it is a barbiturate, and if you remember from our previous conversations around barbiturates, barbiturates tend to make people hypersensitive to pain. And so that can be a challenge when somebody is given coming out of general anesthesia. In most cases, they'll kind of piggyback a narcotic on with it, so they're not going to be as sensitive. To the, they're, they're going to be hypersensitized due to the barbiturate, but then the narcotic would make them less sensitive to the pain because it's going to act as an analgesic. There you have ketamine on the right. You see ketamine, the reason why we like it is you don't get the depressed vital signs. And you might even get a little bit of stimulation via respiration and also cardiovascular stimulation. So it causes analgesia without a full loss of, con loss of consciousness, as a consciousness pardon me, at a reasonably low dose. Um, if you give a whole bunch of ketamine, you can see a loss of consciousness. But at the dose that's frequently used, they're, they're not actually losing consciousness. They, don't, they also don't get any skeletal muscle relaxation. So really all the ketamine is doing is it's acting as an analgesic agent in these kinds of situations. Um, I mentioned earlier the um, nightmares, hallucinations, kind of they get quite a bit of terror, especially in kids. And so that is a side effect of ketamine. Um, all right, so let's just really quickly, um, I just want to say that there's a whole bunch of other IV anesthetics, not just ketamine and, and thiopental, but they all sort of have similar characteristics to our inhalation analgesi uh, anesthetics, pardon me, um, because they're all going to be general depression depressants, but we're going to have different versions. So here are some examples. You're not responsible for knowing these, but... I just wanted to give them to you. These are the inhalation drugs. These are the IV drugs over here. Um, some of the barbiturates, some are barbiturates. Um, this one is right here. And also um, thiopental I mentioned. We've got some benzos on our list. I guess they're not on the list, but benzos are used. I gave you the example of midazolam over down at the bottom is a benzo that's used for um, anesthesia, especially the induction of anesthesia, which is putting them under pretty quickly. Um, none of the depressants, the barbiturates nor the benzos are analgesics, right? They're just they're just going to be anesthetics. That's their that's their role in that sort of triad of the goals of anesthesia. So here's our st stages of anesthesia, stages one through four. Um, stage one is just the loss of pain. They're they're losing general sensation, but they're awake, and they are, will stay in stage one until they lose consciousness. In stage two, they move into a loss of consciousness, and we see excitement and hyperactivity. Um, sometimes the patient might try to resist treatment at this point, um, and the, this is where we start to see some of the vital signs get disrupted. Then we go into stage, so the, at the end of stage one, then we go into stage two, which is a sort of hyperexcitable, in some cases, kind of panic state. Um, this is where we kind of give them things to calm them down, like, for example, a benzodiazepine would be a good choice. Then we go into stage three, which is surgical anesthesia. At this point, we are going to see muscles become relaxed. They're going to calm down. The breathing and the cardiovascular system is going to stabilize. The eye movements are going to slow down, and the patient is going to become still, and they're going to remain in this state 
until the surgical procedure ends. This is when the surgical procedure can start and hopefully they'll remain in stage three until the surgical procedure ends. Stage four is something that we're trying to avoid. And this is paralysis of the brainstem, right? The, the, the um, medulla, which is what ultimately controls all of our vital organs and including the heart and the respiratory center. So of course you all know if the heart stops beating or they stop breathing, they could die. So we are, this stage four is not a desirable stage for anesthesia traditionally. So those are the stages of general anesthesia. So what I would like you to remember to take home from this is just simply that there's three goals and what are they? Um, that <laughs> that um, not one drug can meet all of those goals and that there's a whole bunch of different agents that are used, but benzodiazepines, barbiturates are on the list as well as narcotics. And um, that the route of administration for these anesthetics are um, IV or inhalation traditionally. And I believe that is it for this video. So we will um, come back after, well, whenever you come back to this, we're gonna talk about drugs that selectively modify the central nervous system. And we're gonna start with a conversation about epilepsy and then Parkinson's disease. So that will be the next video. I'll see you then.